Welcome, everybody. We are very happy that you have joined us today uh, for the fourth in a series of six lectures about Jewish languages and names. I'm Professor Sarah Bunin Benor of Hebrew Union College and the director of the Jewish Language. Welcome, everybody. We are very happy that you have joined us today uh, for the fourth in a series of six lectures about Jewish languages and names. I'm Professor Sarah Bunin Benor of Hebrew Union College and the director of the Jewish Language. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, we are very happy that you have joined us today. Okay, got it. Thank you. So yes, uh, and I am here today not only with the Jewish Language Project and Jewish Live, which has sponsored and organized this series, but also with the Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University, which is the sponsor of the book project that we'll be talking about today. And I'm honored to be here today with my wonderful colleagues, Jonathan Krasner of Brandeis and Sharon Avni of CUNY who jointly with me wrote this book, Ruach, this book that we'll be talking about today. And our topic for today's lecture is Ruach in the Chadar Ochel, Language at American Jewish Summer Camps. And don't worry, we will be translating starting now. Ruach means spirit and Chadar Ochel means dining hall. So if you want to see the uh, participants, you can click on the little squares and you should be able to rearrange them. And I recommend putting the speaker in the upper right hand corner. I'm going to be starting and then my colleagues will be speaking later in the talk today. So I want to start with a video. This is a comedian named Benji Lovett speaking to a group of Americans spending time in Israel. Well, my Jewish identity, I would say, didn't, you know, I wasn't born. I'm a big Zionist. I uh, grew up going to Jewish summer camp. Graduates of Jewish summer camp, clap your hands. And, ah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We love Jewish summer camp, don't we? Yeah. We learn so much. We learn about Jewish culture, Jewish community, Jewish peoplehood. You know, we didn't learn the Jewish language of Hebrew. <laughs> we thought we learned Hebrew. We learned nouns. You see, nobody ever left camp actually able to construct a sentence. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you ever find yourself in the situation where you have to say, singing, dancing, camper counselor, dining room. <laughs> you might be okay. If you think you learned Hebrew at Jewish summer camp, try telling them that at LL Security. So, uh, do you know Hebrew? Why, sure, I went to Jewish summer camp. Zematau sapo. Sheket babakasha. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> so what we see here is really a, a comedy routine about Hebrew at Jewish summer camp, which is really the topic of our, our lecture today. And you see that Hebrew at Jewish summer camp is a topic of conversation, debate, and humor among American Jews. So today we're gonna to be answering three questions. How is Hebrew used at Jewish summer camps today? How do people feel about that Hebrew usage? And how did camp Hebrew usage develop historically? And our main points are that most camps use Hebrew as a way of fostering connections, not proficiency in the Hebrew language. Hebrew use at camp has been a locus for diverse opinions about what it means to be an American Jew. So first, a little bit about the study, which is being published in July as a book. And the three of us just received our copies last week. And you can see us smiling here with the product of our many years of hard work. And it's funded by the Mandel Center, as I mentioned, with additional funding from CASG, the Wexner Foundation, HUC, and CUNY. And we conducted our research between 2012 and 2015. We did historical research using archives and interviews, a survey of camp directors, observations at 36 camps, which I think was our favorite part. Well, it was my favorite part. Uh, observations of various trainings and interviews with camp directors and staff and focus groups and interviews with campers and alumni. 
And here you can see the camps that we visited were in various places around the country, but especially in the Northeast and in Southern California. And we visited camps of many different types from secular to Orthodox and from progressive Zionist to eco-Jewish. So just a few definitions. Camp Hebraized English is a term that we came up with. Sometimes we call it C-H-E or Chi. It's a register of Jewish American English that includes Hebrew words. And this can include both Jewish life words and camp words. By Jewish life words, we mean words that are used in other Jewish communal settings like Shabbat Shalom, Ruach, Birkat Hamazon, Beteavon, and camp words, words that are used primarily at camp that refer to locations, roles, and activities at camp, like srif, meaning cabin, chadar ochel, dining hall, madrich, counselor, and peula, activity. And so at many camps, you get sentences like this in CHE. Madrichim, madrichot, you know which chanichim from your srifim need to take meds. After the beer cut, please go directly to the Teatron for Pi'ulat Erev. And so you see here, there are several camp words and one Jewish life word in this sentence. But it is primarily English. And CHE is one aspect of what we are calling Hebrew infusion, which is when camp staff members incorporate elements of Hebrew into the primarily English-speaking environment through songs, signs, games, and words. The primary goal of infusion is identity formation and connection rather than proficiency in Hebrew. And when I say connection, I mean this triangular connection between the Jewish camper, the Hebrew language, and that camp, American Jews, the Jewish people, and Israel, various Jewish collectivities. All three of these are connected, and the camper is supposed to form these ideological connections to the Hebrew language and to these other Jewish collectivities by experiencing Hebrew infusion at Jewish summer camps. And this is not just a Jewish thing, it's a broader phenomenon that we call ethno-linguistic infusion, where community leaders incorporate fragments of the group language into an environment that's conducted primarily in another language in order to foster those ideological connections. Again, this triangular connection between the individual, the group, and the language. And so for example, we see this among Elam Pomo Indians in California, where most participants do not understand Elam, this Native American language. And so ceremonies are conducted in English, but they're framed by greetings and songs and blessings in Elam. And Sri Lankan Tamil immigrants in Canada, the US and the UK come speaking the language called Tamil, but the children generally speak English and have limited proficiency in Tamil, but they use loan words and that's words from Tamil used within English and ritualized non-comprehending recitation of Tamil chants, prayers, and speeches. And we see a similar thing in Cornwall, England, where many public and private signs are in Kernoic which has not been transmitted intergenerationally since the 19th century, but it plays an important role in the sense of communal identity of this region of England. So how does Hebrew infusion work? Well, I'm gonna give you some examples and you'll see if, if you can see the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you see a percentage and that is the percentage of camps that say they do each of these practices on our survey. So all of the camps say that they do blessings, songs, and prayers, or prayers. And group names are also quite common. For example, the Sabras, Sofim, Nachshonim, Kochavim, Chalutzim, and Seniors at Camp Alonim in California. Activity names are often in Hebrew. And remember, they're discussed in English sentences. So even though this schedule here has most of the activities using Hebrew words, notice they're written in English letters, and when people talk about them, they talk about them in English sentences. We also see location names in Hebrew. And we see also many words at Jewish summer camps from Hebrew, including Jewish life words and camp words. Jewish life words, for example, these that we um, saw on the website of Camp Modin, 
And you can see here that various networks of camps report using many Jewish life words. Most of the camps use at least five of these Jewish life words that we have listed here. But when we look at camp words, they are much more common in Zionist networks like Ramah, B'nai Akiva, Young Judea, and Habonim Dror, much less common in the JCC Association camps and camps with no network, Orthodox camps, and the Association for Independent Jewish camps. Another very common feature of Hebrew infusion is signs. We see liturgical and biblical quotes often displayed in beautiful murals and placards all around camp. And we also see names of locations in signage around camp that are in Hebrew words, sometimes in Hebrew letters and sometimes either or also in transliteration, meaning Hebrew words represented in English letters. Another type of sign is pedagogical signs, where some camps will post a label on a location or an object. Now, we don't need the label on the chair to know that this is a chair, right? This is intended to teach some Hebrew words. And you also see that with lists of words, for example, this list of kitchen words from Camp Gilboa. We also have many camps that report using fun activities to teach Hebrew words, games, skits, and songs. And these are often done by visiting Israeli staff. So uh, an example of this is from these, um, these wonderful hom homophonous word pairs from Camp Asrui, which is, I have a Hershey kiss in my pocket, kiss, pocket. It works better with an Israeli accent. Or it is cold in my car, cold, car. And sometimes these are done in skits that involve confusion. Um, so for example, someone comes in with a bag and someone says to that person, oh, I like your tick. And he says, I have a tick? Where, where's my tick? And then someone, it might be called Ish Ivri or Mr. Milon, a Hebrew man or Mr. Dictionary comes in and often wearing an Israeli flag as a cape and as a superhero explains the confusion that tick is an English word for bug and teak is a Hebrew word for bag and then the whole thing is resolved. Or when we ask about Hebrew words at camp, many people mention the little skit about, ah, there's a fork in Ma's leg, ouch. And that, the, the word Ma's leg means fork, right? Um, and so that is a very visceral one, but one that many people remember. And these skits are not really intended to help people become more proficient speakers of Hebrew. What they are intended for is really to foster the connections between English and Hebrew, and to emphasize that Hebrew can be a fun part of American Jewish life. Other informal ways of teaching might be like when someone says a big ma'agal with everybody in it, which is a chant done at some camps, and a counselor says to a new camper, let's make a big circle. Ma'agal means circle, right? So they're teaching this word, not so that this person will become proficient in Hebrew, but so this person will understand camp, camp Hebraized English. Another common way of teaching Hebrew words is the sandwich method. We're going to the Agam, lake, Agam. There's a clap there, making a sandwich, a Hebrew word sandwich. Or another fun way of doing this is the Israeli counselor who stands at the top of the water slide and won't let the kids slide down until they say a Hebrew password. Another very common way of incorporating Hebrew into camp is through Israeli shlichim or emissaries who use Hebrew informally with campers. Another common way is a call and response exchange. For example, at this camp, Bechol Ashon, which is a camp for Jews of color, they have a ritual where every day they visit a new Jewish community from a different part of the world. And as they're getting clues about where they're gonna visit that day, they chant, Efo Eliyahu Ba Olam. Or at Camp Gilboa, where they have an exchange like this, Shabbat Shalom, Machane Gilboa, Shabbat Shalom, Michael Vajessica Vesera, Nitzanim Kulampo, 
Kulanu po, sayalim, kulam po, kulanu po. Now, you don't actually need to really know Hebrew to do this exchange. You just need to know these set phrases that are part of these exchanges. And the same goes for announcements. Not as many camps. Before we were up at 62%, now we're down to 44% of camps that say they do ritualized announcements using Hebrew words. For example, some Ramah camps will say, meaning benches on the tables, or they will make announcements about where each group is supposed to go. Gesher, limigrash kadrosal, nitzanim, legaziva banim, adat shalom, lemakom tefillah. Now you don't need to know Hebrew, all you need to do is listen for the name of your group and the name of the location. And you need to know that l means to. So people do end up learning some Hebrew from these ritualized, routinized announcements, but they don't necessarily gain the active speaking skills. On the other hand, a smaller percentage of camps do report using Hebrew announcements with novel sentences that are not just these set phrases. Only 20% of camps report using Hebrew classes. And when they say classes, often they are really more fun activities intended to further foster that understanding of Hebrew as a fun activity of Jewish summer camps. And only 12% of camps report doing a theatrical production in Hebrew, but this is common in the Ramah camp network where they have done many Hebrew musicals ranging from hair, which is this one, to Frozen, to The Lion King. Some camps do have immersion programs, sometimes optional or sometimes required, like Camp Ramah Rama in New England, which has Cafe Ramah, or Ramah de Rome, which has Hebrew through activities, including Zumba, for example. And there are a few camps that are conducted either an entire division or the whole camp entirely or mostly in Hebrew. For example, Olin Sang Ruby Union Institute in Wisconsin and Camp Masad, Manitoba. And there were a few camps that were geared toward Israeli American kids that were conducted in Hebrew, but as far as I know, these do not exist anymore. So you see that the majority of camps do use um, connection-based activities, Hebrew infusion activities, like the blessings, the songs, the names for units, etc. And very few camps use activities that are geared toward Hebrew proficiency, like classes and immersion. So most camps are interested in connection, not proficiency. And we see this on this chart here, which uh, shows various Hebrew practices. We asked camps, how important are they in your camp? And those that are related to Hebrew proficiency are very rare. Most camps do not do them. Those that have to do with Hebrew infusion, like strengthening knowledge of Hebrew songs and connection to Hebrew, about half of the camps consider them to be important. But the majority of camps are really interested in Jewish connection, enhancing personal Jewish identity and connection to the Jewish people and the state of Israel. So we feel that these Hebrew practices are really intended to further these ideological connections. And I now turn it over to Sharon. Hi, Hi. thanks, Sarah. Um, so we just got a really good um, landscape of all the ways that Hebrews used at the various uh, Jewish overnight camps. And I wanna use the time that I have to talk about not just the types of Hebrew being used, but what Hebrew is actually doing. Uh, what is it um, saying about broader things? And so I wanted to introduce this concept, which is called language ideologies, and it comes out of the field of linguistic anthropology. And specifically, language ideologies refers to people's feelings, their dispositions, and ideas about languages and speakers of languages. So it's what people think about language. And so 
one way we can think about language ideologies is, well, what are the Hebrew language ideologies that exist? And how do they help us understand uh, Hebrew usage at camp? Oh, I forgot that I can't. I, when to press the thing, I forgot that Sarah was in charge of this thing. Okay, so I want to look at three, what we can think of as three sites or three ways of thinking about Hebrew language ideologies. So one is authenticity. What are ideologies? What are belief that, what do the beliefs that people have about Hebrew and Hebrew speakers, what can this talk, tell us about authenticity, legitimacy, and competency? So we'll start with authenticity and ideologies of, about authenticity really intersect or they go along with beliefs about language purism which we can basically define as either uh, is recognizing one type of language or variety of language as being intrinsically higher quality or better than other varieties of language. So if we think about authenticity, we can think about how, how people think about what is the pure language, what is the best language. And so one of the things that we came to see are these dialogues or these conversation of whether Camp Hebraized Hebrew taints or ruins Hebrew. So there's this notion that that Hebrew exists and this kind of camp Hebrew might be tainting it or ruining it. And so it raises a more broader question about what people, campers and others who think about camp, what do they consider the authentic form of Hebrew? Is it only the Hebrew that exists in Israel? And then the question becomes, well, which Hebrew in Israel? Because even within, um, the state of Israel, there's different varieties or different types of Hebrew speakers. So if we think about Hebrew authenticity, we can think about words like here, like Hadar, Mark, Meltz, Shabbat, I can never say this word. Shabbatians. Shabbatians, thank you. To options and picnic. Now, these are obviously not words that exist in Israeli Hebrew, but these are words that very much exist in the different camps that use them. Um, and so the question is, are these authentic Hebrew words or are they not? And for many camps, they might argue that they are, and many others would argue equally uh, that they are not authentic Hebrew words. And um, I took a quote from a, a, a person working at the JCCA who said the word chesed connects you to Jews all over the world today because that's a word that's been part of the Jewish conversation since the beginning. The weird word that got invented in your camp that nobody else uses, like mo for moedon, which is like a communal clubhouse <laughs> doesn't connect you to anybody other than your camp community. So in this kind of statement, we get a sense of these ideologies of authenticity and which language is, what type of Hebrew is, is considered better than the others. The second site that we can look at for language ideologies has to do with um, with Hebrew legitimacy. So whereas authenticity is about the language itself, which variety of Hebrew, I like to think of Hebrew uh, legitimacy as really about the speaker, who's the speaker. And then the questions are, who's the legitimate Hebrew speaker? Who's that ideal Hebrew speaker? Um, and so uh, we have a quote from Camp Moshe I always tell kids and staff that it couldn't be a camp that talks about Israel and didn't have authentic Israelis who speak the authentic language. So a sentence like this, uh, a statement like this, really implies, or well, does more than imply that um, Israelis are the authentic, they're the legitimate speakers of the real language of Hebrew, whereas what's going on in camp is not necessarily. Um, we can also think about ideologies of legitimacy from the perspective of the Israelis, the shlichim or other Israelis, uh, Israeli staff at camp. So two quotes from uh, different shlichim, some part of camp Hebrew lose all trace of actual Hebrew. That was one and another said, well, campers think that shabax is an actual Hebrew word. So shabax is a word at that particular camp, the camp Alumim, that is used 
And this Israeli is saying that, you know, these are not actual words. And the word actual is also really interesting here. Um, um, another is from uh, Rama, as, as someone said, I'll say with respect, this is an Israeli sh uh, shaliach working at one of the Rama camps said, I'll say with respect, the Hebrew of camp Rama is not necessarily a read. They're creating a Rama-like reality, which is nostalgically relating to a language that, you know, lo muvan, it's not understood. It's not understood by Hebrew speakers. So again, it's not only how Americans are thinking about the Hebrew that's being used at camp, but also that how Israelis are understanding who the legitimate Hebrew speaker is. The third site of language ideologies um, that I think is helpful to think about is Hebrew competency. And here, unlike thinking about the language itself or the speakers, here it's thinking about how well does a person need to know a language, to be considered a speaker of that language. So this has to do with language proficiency. And um, when we think about the kind of Hebrew that's being used at camp, I wouldn't say, or many people wouldn't necessarily say that camp Hebrew is about a level of proficiency, meaning you're not going to be able to necessarily do all sorts of he uh, things in Hebrew, uh, but that the, the type of Hebrew that's being used in camp is a different type of knowledge and it has a different, and it's building different attachments. So it's not only a measure of what the person knows, but how they feel. And this, this speaks to these questions about whether immersion, being in a full immersive Hebrew environment all day, which has become a little more popular in some uh, Jewish day camps, versus what goes on more in overnight camps, which is this infusion that Sarah spoke about um, um, with so much detail before. And we have these uh, ideas of, of ideologies of Hebrew competency. I'd much rather have a youngster say, I'm sorry, I'm left the dining room instead of I'm walking to the Chagar Ochel. You know, if all you know is how to ochel, you can't do much with that noun. Ani kotev nichtav to my parents is more important to me than I'm writing a letter to my home. So here, this speaker is sort of saying, like, what is what you're what is it that we're supposed to know? He, according to this person, it's more important to know verbs and being able to make a sentence than to know nouns, which is kind of relates back to what we introduced at the very beginning with, ben, uh, with Benji Lovett saying he knew all these nouns. So this person that we interviewed at Asrui is saying that, you know, these nouns, this isn't enough. This isn't enough uh, to really know uh, Hebrew. So this is these are ideologies of Hebrew competency. The next one, if they're getting into Judaism because we made up some fun word and then that sparked their interest to go further, fine. To insist upon full sentences in Hebrew is going to cause some campers to retract. And then they could potentially say that we moved what they call Jewish learning, which they now call Pulat Sababa at Camp uh, Solomon Schechter, uh, is not fun or Ivrit, Hebrew is not fun. So here we have a different, a different side of that, um, of that ideology that um, what is worth teaching, how much, uh, how much determining what is the right amount is going to actually repel or perhaps bring about some diminishing returns. And so just to summarize, um, if we think about Hebrew ideologies as a way, as a lens for thinking about Jewish camp, uh, then it, it helps us to also think about issues of how translation and transliteration are used at camp, um, issues of pronunciation of Hebrew at camp, what kind of pronunciation is used, whether it's Israeli Hebrew pronunciation, Sephardic, Ashkenazic uh, types, um, the camp Hebrew user and the Jewish community, so how camp Hebrew gets taken out and used in other contexts um, during the rest of the year, and also helps us think a little bit more about the role of Israelis and, in general, Israel education at camp. And so just to, to my, I guess my last sentence would be that 
um, I think that these language ideologies, which we talk a lot more about in the book, help us to think about um, how we can better understand the connection between Hebrew, camp, community, and um, issues of identity and, and, and what it means to, uh, uh, in the camp context. So thanks, and I'm passing it over to Jonathan. Great. So I'm a historian in the group of the three of us. Um, and what I'd like to do for the next little while is to talk a little bit about the historical background um, behind uh, what my colleagues Sarah and Sharon have spoken about. In other words, how do we get to this point um, where Hebrew infusion is so um, popular um, and ubiquitous at summer camps? Um, and uh, I think that it's important for us to kind of know that there's always been Hebrew at Jewish summer camps in America, all the way going back to the first Jewish summer camps um, back in the early 20th century. Um, initially, the Hebrew that was spoken at these camps was mostly in the context of prayers. Um, there was also Yiddish that was spoken between campers because a lot of the campers that went especially to the um, fresh air camps, the camps that were for uh, kids from uh, underprivileged backgrounds, um, giving them a summer up in the country. Those kids were Yiddish speakers, their families were Yiddish speakers. So they would speak Yiddish to themselves, even if the official camp language was English. Um, and even you know, in the late 20th century, many camps, JCC camps, uh, Y camps, the reform camps, many Zionist camps, um, the idea of incorporating Hebrew uh, by infusing it the way that Sarah and Sharon have talked about really fit very nicely um, because they were interested in promoting Jewish identity in a camp context. Um, but one thing that Hebrew did that other forms of Judaism, you know, kind of, um, you know, had perhaps a little bit more problems associated with it is that Hebrew by and large was a secular way of being Jewish and it wasn't as controversial as a camp importing religious aspects of being Jewish, um, where there might be some fear on the part of certain parents that either you were too religious or you weren't religious enough, or how are you religious? Were you orthodox? Were you conservative? Were you reform? Hebrew was something that everybody could agree on. So, um, so or, or most people could agree on. So uh, Hebrew was very popular, became very popular, um, you know, even in camps uh, like the reform movement camps that historically um, had never promoted Hebrew. Uh, and uh, certainly by the late 60s and the 70s, at some of these camps, like for example, uh, in uh, at Camp Azrui uh, in uh, Wisconsin, um, they created a special Hebrew immersion program um, called Chalutzim in one of their divisions. Um, but So by and large, it wasn't a problem. But what about those camps that really were invested in Hebrew? Um, and, uh, and, and not only just incorporating some Hebrew, but really wanted their kids to learn how to speak Hebrew as a living language. Um, and in order to understand those camps and to understand why the um, desire for immersion lost out to infusion, um, I want to look at two camps uh, in particular. I want to look at Camp Massad, which was a Zionist Hebrew speaking camp uh, that existed from the early 40s until the late 70s. I believe 1981 was its last year. Um, and the Ramah camps, the camps of the conservative movement uh, that started in 1947 as uh, Hebrew speaking camps, um, and today are really more. Uh, infusion camps rather than immersion camps. They're camps where Hebrew is spoken, um, but they're not Hebrew speaking camps, if you can understand the difference here. Um, so let's go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so let's talk about Massad first. Uh, Massad, um, in order to understand Massad, you have to understand its director, Shlomo Schulzinger. Schulzinger believed very, very strongly in the idea that Hebrew should be the foundation for Jewish identity. Um, that the key to preserving 
Jewish culture and modernity was learning how to speak the Hebrew language. Um, he was also very inspired by the creation of the state of Israel. Um, he wanted to promote Zionism. Uh, he himself had grown up uh, in, uh, in what was Palestine at that time. Um, and so uh, Schulzinger at his camps, which were located in Pennsylvania, um, and then later uh, in the Canadian Ramah camps, which were inspired by the camps that uh, began in the Pocono Mountains, um, they really focused on Hebrew immersion, speaking Hebrew, as you can see here from this quote, this belief that Hebrew is the key to the Jewish treasure house, um, and uh, all aspects of camp life were in Hebrew. If we go to the next slide, um, you can see uh, that uh, even something like baseball um, was done in Hebrew. Uh, there was a whole vocabulary for baseball that was created, um, and uh, the terms were, as you can see, they were placed on um, a large uh, plaque, um, and people were encouraged to use those terms. Uh, Hebrew was used uh, at the swimming pool, um, although you can see here from the English sign that when it came to safety, there was also English that was there just in case somebody didn't understand the Hebrew. Um, but uh, the the pitla, the activity of swimming, was done in Hebrew. Um, cultural activities were done in Hebrew. The dining room was all conducted in Hebrew. Every aspect of camp, the names of the, the roads were in Hebrew. Everything was in Hebrew. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that one way in which they were able to accomplish this was by creating this Hebrew, this English Hebrew dictionary that they gave to every single camper. Um, and uh, campers would walk around with their dictionaries if they needed to. Um, hopefully over time they would uh, be able to master the language of camp. Um, and uh, this dictionary was, a, the difference between this dictionary, let's say, and a regular Hebrew English dictionary is that all of the words in this dictionary were really tailor-made for camping. The focus was on everyday life, learning how to say, let's say, articles of clothing, um, learning how to say cleanup, which is nikayon, um, learning how to say the different kinds of foods that may have been served in the dining room. All of those things were in this uh, Hebrew English dictionary that was created by the founder of Masad, Schulzinger, um, and two of his associates. Um, so if we ask ourselves, how did it work in practice? Well, for a long time, it worked very well. Um, there was one uh, aspect of camp that made it much, much more effective as a location for learning Hebrew than a Hebrew school, a religious school, or even a day school. And that is that camps were 24 seven environments. They were cloistered environments. They were secluded. They were separated both by time and by space. Um, and therefore um, they could be immersive environments in a way that uh, let's say a regular school environment couldn't be. Um, and uh, we know even today that there is a lot of discussion about how much of real life should be allowed to um, you know, interrupt camp. Should campers be allowed to have cell phones? Should campers be allowed to bring their own music to camp? Um, well, that was even more so for Schulzinger and for Massad because outside culture was basically American English culture. And what they wanted to do was create an environment that was entirely a Hebrew speaking environment. Um, and for a while it worked really well. Um, although by the 70s, um, there was a decline. Um, and we can talk a little bit, maybe in the question and answer period, about why there was this decline. But let's talk about Ramah, because Ramah in some ways is even more interesting than Masad, um, although um, I guess a Masadnik would probably disagree with me about that. Um, but um, Ramah is interesting because Ramah started as a Hebrew speaking camp. Ramah was inspired in the same way that Masad was. In fact, the two founders of Ramah, um, Moshe Davis and Sylvia Ettenberg, were involved in Camp Masad. Sylvia Ettenberg was the first girls head counselor at Masad, and they strongly believed in making Ma Ramah a Hebrew speaking camp. But there was one very, very important difference between uh, Masad and Ramah. At Masad, Hebrew was really the most important thing. Hebrew was the reason for the camp's being. 
Zionism was the reason for the camps being. When you when when my, when Ramah was founded, the emphasis was on conservative Judaism. It was founded by the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, um, and it was founded with uh, this idea that conservative Judaism was growing in post-war America, that all these synagogues were being built in the suburbs um, that were conservative affiliated synagogues, and Ramah was gonna be the place where the leadership of the conservative movement was going to be um, schooled and um, groomed for the future. It was also post-Holocaust and there was a lot of emphasis on the American Jewish community taking the mantle from Europe um, and uh, keeping Judaism alive. And for conservative Judaism and reform Judaism for that matter, in post-war America, the center of Jewish life was the synagogue. Um, and so Hebrew was important because Hebrew allowed you to be able to read Torah. It allowed you to read prayers. Um, it allowed you to be immersed in Jewish culture, um, but Hebrew was an instrumental value. It wasn't an intrinsic value um, in the same way. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see that uh, um, you, you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, they believed in Hebrew. You have Seymour Fox, one of the found, uh, one of the directors of Camp Ramah, saying all of us believed that if you wanted to understand and be part of Jewish history, you had no choice but to master Hebrew. Um, but at the same time, um, you have Judah Golden, who was um, one of the early heads of the National Ramah Commission, saying we're not a Zionist camp. It's not that we exclude Israel or the subject of, of Zionism. It's just that our program is not one which revolves primarily around Israel. They were an American camp. They were interested in the future of conservative Judaism in America. By the way, after the 67 war, it becomes a much more Zionist camp. So maybe there are some of you on this call who went to Ramah and who are asking yourselves, what is he talking about? Were, what do you mean that it wasn't a Zionist camp? Um, you might be surprised to know that they wouldn't fly the flag of the state of Israel during the first few years of camp at Camp Ramah Poconos because they were afraid of being um, accused of dual loyalties. But that of course changed. Um, but then you have Sovietenberg saying, a number of us felt that although Hebrew should be the language of camp, Hebrew was only an instrument, it couldn't be the goal. So if we go to the next slide, we see that the reality of Hebrew at camp as opposed to sort of the sort of ideal of Hebrew at camp um, was that Hebrew was seen as integral to camp life. It was the official public language of camp, but then in practice, campers and counselors often utilized this camp Hebraized English that Sarah and Sharon were talking about before. In other words, they spoke in English, but they um, had lots of Hebrew words that they would incorporate into their um, into their English. And of course, they sang Hebrew songs and they performed uh, plays in Hebrew as, as Sarah showed us before. This was all very much a part of Ramah culture. Um, but uh, there was a kind of a, a wink and a nod that even though we are a Hebrew camp, um, we, as one of the directors said, we pay tribute to Hebrew um, before we sort of lapse into a kind of a Hebrew English uh, synthesis. So if we go to the next slide, um, we can see some people really, really didn't like this. Uh, Bill Novak writing in 1972, who had gone to Ramah when it was more of a purist Hebrew speaking camp, he writes, Hebrew at Ramah has ceased to be a language. It's merely a specialized vocabulary. Um, he's probably, you know, I think uh, Benji Levitt, um, who we saw early on, Levitt, um, who we saw early on would probably resonate with a lot of what Bill Novak is saying over here. We learned how to say the words for butter and milk and, and boating and swimming, but we didn't really learn how to speak Hebrew. Ramah succeeded only in Judaizing or Hebraizing a child's English vocabulary. Ramah campers learn how to do everything in Hebrew except talk in Hebrew. Um, but I want to take a step back for a second and say that, you know, although his... Um, his critique is valid. Um, we should also understand that this really immersive, 
in Jewish environment that was created through Camp Hebraized English had a profound effect on generations of campers. Um, and so even if they didn't come home proficient Hebrew speakers, um, they were really, I'd say, immersed in the culture of, of Hebrew and Judaism, even you know, as they weren't able to necessarily speak. Um, and there are a couple of other reasons, I think, why um, immersion lost out to infusion at Raman. I'll just go through them very quickly because I want to make sure we leave time for questions and answers. Number one, um, there was a tension between the progressive values of Camp Raman and speaking Hebrew. Um, if counselors are trying to understand their campers and trying to give their campers uh, a sense of feeling at home, it's very hard to do that in a language that the campers don't understand. And so naturally, counselors uh, gravitated to English. Second, economic imperatives. Very early on, there were rules about how much Hebrew you needed to know in order to go to Ramah. But Ramah was a business as well as a, you know, as, as a ideological experiment. Um, and they needed campers, especially as they opened up more and more camps. They had to loosen the requirements for Hebrew speaking. And also they needed counselors who could speak Hebrew. Um, and um, it was very embarrassing by the 60s, they wanted to hire their own kids as counselors who went through the Ramah system, um, but many of them weren't fluid Hebrew speakers. So what do you do in that situation? Um, so that's another dilemma. And then finally, there's the creation of the state of Israel. Now you might say to yourself, hey, I don't get that. Creation of the state of Israel should actually be promoting speaking Hebrew. People would want to learn Hebrew so that they could speak with their brothers and sisters in Israel. Well, actually, on some funny level, um, the creation of the state of Israel meant that the onus of keeping Hebrew alive in America wasn't there anymore. Israel was going to keep Hebrew alive. Israel was going to become the focus of Jewish identity in a way that Hebrew could never really be. Um, and because many people in Israel speak English, um, a lot of people in America never really had to learn more than a smattering of Hebrew um, in order to get by in Israel, um, even if they were being laughed at behind their backs. So, um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, in a nutshell, and we can definitely talk about it more during the break, uh, during the question and answer, but that's a nutshell about why um, in, in, um, immersion lost out to infusion. So let me give it back to Sarah. Great, thank you for that wonderful historical overview. And Sharon, thank you for the wonderful discussion of ideologies. So just to conclude, I would say that American Jewish summer camps have come up with creative, fun ways to infuse Hebrew into the primarily English environment. And as Jonathan mentioned, summer camp provides a particularly convenient venue, not just for immersion, but also for intense Hebrew infusion. And this is because of the distinctive locations, roles, and activities that are unique to camp. Many traditions distinguish camp from the outside world. And also the way that Hebrew is used at camp today is heavily influenced by the history that Jonathan talked about. So finally, I would say that Hebrew infusion leads to competing ideologies of proficiency on the one hand and connection on the other hand. And they're not mutually exclusive because of course, if you become proficient, you can also have a strong connection, but you can also have a strong connection to a language and via a language to a place and a people without having that proficiency. So at most camps, connection is the primary driver for Hebrew use. And by connections, we mean connections to the camp, to perhaps a particular community of American Jews, it might be Sephardic Jews or eco-Jews or reformed Jews, to the broader American Jewish community, to Israel and Israelis and to Jews around the world. And to demonstrate that, I'm gonna give the last word to JDate, which created a wonderful commercial that came out as we were doing our research. And you will see what I mean. I am so glad that Jen set us up. Yeah. So how do you guys know each other? Jen and I went to summer camp together. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. You know, I never lost a Maccabi. Oh, whoa. I, I know, Watch right? out. Uh, what's Maccabi, yeah? Oh, man. Mm, I am tired. You know, I never lost a Maccabi. Color Wars? You know what that is? Yeah, we call it Maccabi, too. Do you want to go out and grab a drink? Yes. Do you want to meet my parents? parents? Uh, there you go, that's the end. 
So I'm now gonna open it up for questions. So please type your questions in the chat box. And Sharon, do you wanna start us off by reading some questions? You're on mute. Sorry, did the old, I didn't unmute myself. Okay, so yes, um, so we have a few questions and I guess I'm just gonna, I'm just looking over the last one. Okay, so we have four questions right now and if anybody else has others, please add. So the first one, uh, David Knoll asked ideology. Why is Zionism missing from this conversation? Um, and I don't know if that was directed to me or in general to the broader conversation. Um, I guess that um, I would say that all of the, all the ideologies that I spoke to, um, I didn't mention it today, but that they all do uh, directly or indirectly speak to ideologies about, um, about Israel and about its role or its place as either the center of, of the Jewish uh, people or as a center among many centers of uh, the Jewish people. And so uh, perhaps in, in my talk or in our talk in general tonight, we didn't talk, we didn't say the word Zionism uh, explicitly, uh, but in our book and in general, we talk a lot about uh, camps relationships uh, to Israel, to developing um, attachments to Israel, what they call Israel education or education about Israel. I don't know, Sarah or Jonathan, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little something. Okay. Um, as I think I just put in the chat, um, I thought that I did actually mention Zionism in relation to Mossad, but um, but if I didn't, that question um, might have that come was certainly before. That, that was certainly uh, an important impetus there. Um, Shlomo Schulzinger was uh, from Palestine, came to America, wanted to create a connection between the Zionist project in Palestine and what was going on in America and saw Hebrew as a way to do that. And certainly the Zionist camps, um, camps like Habonim, uh, Young Judea, um, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, Mizrahi camps, uh, later known as Bnei Akiva camps, um, all, you know, all of those camps uh, and, and more focused on uh, the connection between the language of, uh, of Hebrew and Zionism. Although it didn't necessarily mean that they were uh, teaching their campers how to be proficient Hebrew speakers. Um, they didn't necessarily sort of see Zionism as an impetus for proficiency as much as they saw it um, as uh, a part of a larger culture that they wanted to introduce kids to. Um, you know, some more and some less, I would say. Uh, certainly, um, as some of these uh, uh, programs began to create experiences for kids in Israel, as travel to Israel became cheaper, um, like, for example, year course uh, with Young Judea, that became a motivation for the creation of an Ulpan program in Young Judea the year before the kids went to Israel. I see a, um, a question or point, a comment in the chat. Uh, there are questions both in the Q&A section and in the chat section. Um, Paula writes, for those of us who went to Hebrew day school, Camp Massad changed Hebrew from the language of school to the language of fun. And I think that's a beautiful comment that really demonstrates a lot of what we're talking about. So much of the way that Hebrew is used at camp is intended to make people see Hebrew as something fun. And the way that people make decisions about Hebrew use at camp is often to distinguish camp from school, especially from Hebrew school, where Hebrew often gets a bad reputation. Um, one of the other questions, so I'm debating between two, and I feel like they actually speak to each other, these two questions, but Hal Barron wrote in the chat, uh, when I was a camper at Ramah, Wisconsin in the early 60s and a counselor in training in 69, Hebrew was important, but being Jewish in, was in 
but being Jewish in more creative ways was much more important. So he's asking specifically about how, how central that is to Rama uh, today, but I think that that's a great question in general for all of the camps about the shift that Jonathan was talking about that um, Hebrew is being important in and of itself, knowing the language as, as or Hebrew being um, a way to, to be Jewish in a different way and in a creative way. And I think one of the things that Sarah brings up a lot in what she presented tonight is all this enormous creativity that's going on in camps with how they're using uh, Hebrew. So I think that perhaps what was true in the 60s, what Hal is referring to is also uh, to some degree still true today. There was another question. I'll just go to another question. I'm going to open this up to Sarah and Jonathan because I think they will have a lot to say about it. Lex Rothberg wrote, um, I'm curious the extent to which Hebrew infusion, from your vantage point, is one of the key factors distinguishing camps that proactively identifies Jewish camps from those that historically served more Jewish, mostly Jewish camp populations, but don't call themselves Jewish camps or are affiliated with the Foundation for Jewish Camps. So uh, Jonathan or Sarah, would you want to respond to that? Uh, I'm happy to start and Sarah, you can jump in. Um, I think Lex, you're absolutely right. Um, there are a lot of private camps that um, historically uh, were Jewish owned camps where a lot of Jews went to the camp. Um, and, um, you know, a generation ago, some of those camps might have had kosher style food. Some of those camps might have had services um, on Friday night, um, but they weren't Jewish culture camps or Jewish education camps. And um, you're absolutely right that some of those camps did not, or most of those camps did not infuse Hebrew. Um, I know, um, I forget which one of us went to Modin, but- um, Sharon Modin, visited there. Yeah, so Sharon, you do have something to say about this, right? Because you went to Modin, which is in some ways um, sort of, uh, I mean, exemplifies this. Um, it is very much still a Jewish camp, even though it's a private camp. There is a little bit of Hebrew infusion, but it's pretty minimal, right? Am I right, Sharon? Correct, yeah. Sarah, you want to add? Yes, yeah, no, that's great. And I, I want to add another question that's for you, Jonathan. Martin asks, was there an easy transition from Ashkenazi Hebrew to modern Hebrew pronunciation, or did that cause tension in the 50s? So that's really interesting. So the camps that were Zionist camps, um, by and large, uh, they went with a Sephardic influenced um, Hebrew speaking uh, style from the very, very beginning. So if you go to Ramah or you go to Masad or you go to uh, you know, Young Judea or Habonim, um, they were making an effort to try to speak Hebrew the way that Chalutzim in Palestine were speaking Hebrew, the way that Israelis were speaking Hebrew. Um, but if you take a look at like the reform movement or you take a look at JCC camps, um, they were speaking Ashkenazi, they weren't speaking Sephardi. Um, and so um, there was a transition and it was fa it's fascinating when you go back and look at how the transition started. It started with music. It started with Israeli songs. The kids would sing um, and they'd sing those songs the way that Israelis would sing those songs, but then they would, let's say, go to prayer service and still use Ashkenazi um, in, you know, inflected Hebrew. And it really took a kind of about a decade for that to shift. And then I think the 67 war was a real turning point there where people began to really identify with Israel. And there was a, a effort on the part of many synagogues, I think, um, to become, uh, you know, more influenced by that way of speaking Hebrew and that that infused the camps. So we have one last time for one last question and it's about the use of innovative Hebrew. Someone asks about a Maryland camp, Habonim Camp Mosheva, that developed a form of Hebrew that avoids using the gender endings that Israeli Hebrew requires in an effort to be inclusive. Can we say something about that? So Sharon, do you want to address that? Right, so I think it started last year, or was it? Uh, uh, 2015. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Time flies, right? <laughs> Time flies. So right, They've, they have sort of made Hebrew a gender neutral language and have changed endings, uh, taken away, you know, what is 
how verbs are conjugated and all of that by gender. And I don't know. I mean, I think in the camp they've been successful and it's something I, I assume they're really proud of. I don't know how much it has extended beyond that. Sarah, do you, do you know? Yeah, I don't think it has extended beyond that, except for in limited context of people co being called up for an aliyah in synagogues. But the the uh, habonim um, endings, like saying habonimot and saying chanichol, Habonimot is the im ot masculine and feminine um, plural suffixes together, and ol or chol is a uh, gender neutral suffix that can make a word that could be masculine or feminine into a gender neutral term. So this was important for gender non-binary campers and counselors, chani chimot and madri chimot. Uh, so someone can say I'm a chani chol, or you can say um, go give this to a madri chol, meaning a counselor, but not specifying the gender. And that had a huge impact on the movement, the, the Habonim Dor Progressive Zionist movement, where they, and we have a very interesting discussion of this in chapter eight of our book, which I highly recommend. Uh, so unfortunately we're out of time. So thank you all for joining us today. And I look forward to um, seeing you next week where, where we'll be talking about family names. You can pre-order the book on Amazon, by the way, and um, I guess maybe Sarah next time can tell you a little bit there. I think there are other ways to get the book as well. So um, it was, this was a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed doing it, and uh, I hope that your the rest of your sessions go well. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you, for joining. Thank you. Bye, all.